I don't know they're being recorded. All right, perfect. And you can still share it all, all right, Dan? Yeah, as long as you can still see it. I can still see it. So perfect. Let's just get into it. Ten minutes behind. That's my fault. Uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for hanging, hanging with me there. Sorry about those technical difficulties. Uh, Dan, this is actually going to work out great because I can just say, like, next slide and stuff, and you can do all the, uh, the clicking. Perfect. All right. Well, welcome to Getting Started Trapping. It's an AFI Lunch and Learn event. This is going to be in three parts. Tonight, we're just going to talk, like, trapping history, trapping basic, trapping ethics. Tomorrow, or, uh, next week, we're going to get into land trapping. And the week after that, we're going to get into water trapping. So, yeah, let's jump into it. Next slide. Um, so thank you to Wisconsin Trappers Education Committee and the Wisconsin Conservation Congress Committee on Education. Uh, they gave us a bunch of these pictures, a bunch of these graphics, and uh, really helped us put this together so it's not just me drawing on a whiteboard batch the whole time. Next slide. Um, just so everybody knows, I think it was pretty clear, but I am not, uh, like, this is not a certified trapping safety class. This will not give you a trapping license in any state. Uh, you still have to go through your state uh, fish and game agency to obtain a trapping license. This is more of just a general overview uh, to see if maybe you'd like to get into trapping, or if you're already into trapping, maybe you'll learn something you don't already know. Next slide. All right, so we're going to go through trapping history. We're going to go through what is the North American model of wildlife conservation and how does trapping fit in. Trapping best management practices, ethics, morality, and then we're going to go through some basic gear, basic trap types, and how to find a spot to trap on public land. Next. All right, so I've got the trapping history broken into two sections. The first section is pre-Lewis and Clark. The second section is going to be after Lewis and Clark, but this is all still in, the, uh, in North America and what will become the United States of America. So uh, fashion in Europe uh, has kind of always driven the U.S. trapping market. It's, it still does, to be honest with you. But uh, pre-Lewis and Clark, there's these beaver felt hats. Beaver felt is, uh, it's not like the leather that you see. It's they scrape the hair off and they weave it together. And it's almost like, like a wool. You see in top hats, you'll see it in like the company Stetson that makes cowboy hats, still makes it today. That's what they're after. So when this started, uh, a company called the Hudson's Bay Company, um, if you read some of the books, the HBC, they said here before Christ because they were the kind of invented the U.S. trapping market uh, after they located Hudson's Bay and made some alliances with the local, uh, what do they call them in Canada, First Nations people. But at that point, there were no white trappers at first or European descent trappers. It was trading with native tribes for pelts that they had. Now, if we quickly established these native tribes. Um, would do the trapping for us. They'd bring loads and loads of canoes worth of pelts, primarily beaver, but also otter, muskrat, even some raccoon and some others. Um, through the Great Lakes, up through Hudson's Bay, trade them at these designated Hudson's Bay Company trading posts where they would get shipped back to England. And obviously every time they changed hands, the price went up. But it got to a point to where um, uh, at that point is the Cree Nation and that part of Hudson's Bay was making... Well, it's today's equivalent of about $500 per beaver pelt. It, it got to be just about insane, the amount of money people were going. Uh, so the Hudson's Bay Company was granted a monopoly by the King of England, uh, which is what they did back then. You'll see it's very similar to uh, like the Dutch East India Trading Company or um, just the, what then became the East India Trading Company. But this is a monopoly where the King of England, the government of England is saying no other companies can open up trapping, trading for fur in this area. Uh, but it also mandated in that uh, monopoly that they would lead Western expansion and find a sea route to the Pacific Ocean. So that's what the Hudson's Bay Company was supposed to be also doing. And really what they ended up doing until the very end is they sat in Hudson's Bay at their pre-established trading posts and just ran this whole fur trading empire. So what this turned into is Hudson's Bay, that's obviously that's run by England, but in France, in Canada at this time, we also have a big French colonialism impact. So they sent what are called voyageurs, which were aspiring young men, normally below six feet tall, which most people were at that time, but below six feet tall, brought at the shoulder, made better canoe paddlers. And these were French citizens that were paid to paddle around these giant canoes and pick up fur from all these Indian tribes, like the, uh, the Huron, the Iroquois Confederation, the Cree, 
uh, anybody who wasn't trading with the Hudson's Bay Company or who was, but was willing to do some trading on the side as well. So all those French voyageurs is what they're called, um, came over and they came as young men and they were actually ended up marrying into uh, these various native nations. And that upset the French government because the goal was they would send these aspiring young men over. They do like a three or a four year term and then they'd come back to France to be granted land and wealth and riches and all this stuff, but they weren't actually coming back to France. Instead, they were staying in the new world, uh, marrying into these various native tribes and starting their own life. That upset France, which caused France then to say, well, we need to send French women over to the New World because that'll stop all this mixing with the native peoples. So they emptied out uh, the jails and the the, uh, the brothels and sent prostitutes and criminals over. And you may have seen that uh, on the History Channel or something, but there was a point where you could get out of French prison if you agreed to marry a prostitute and move to either uh, French Canada or Louisiana. Which brings in another port. So France had couldn't get out through Hudson's Bay because Hudson's Bay was run through England. So France had to take all of their furs down to Louisiana and New Orleans, which they could get out of. Now, what's interesting about that is that makes these uh, these French voyageurs really doing most of the exploring of the Missouri and the Mississippi River pre Lewis and Clark because they have to get stuff from the Hudson's Bay or upper Can or lower Canada area through the American Great Lakes or what would become the American Great Lakes, to the Mississippi River, through the Namakagan and the St. Croix Rivers, all the way down the Mississippi, starting or stopping in cities like St. Louis, Memphis, and eventually New Orleans, where they would put those fur on a boat to France. Anyway, lower Americas, so we're talking the Carolinas, Virginia, um, Georgia even, they still had beaver down there, but the beaver in this part of the world, same as the beaver in like Hudson's Bay of New York, were not as prime as beaver in Canada. So the farther north you go, just in general, the more prime fur gets or the, the better quality is the way of saying that. Um, just because colder winters make thicker fur, bigger animals don't have that necessarily in Georgia, the Carolinas. So what they ended up going after in their fur markets was actually mostly bear. There's also you know deer hide market and you can read Meat Eater's new book and I'm sure it's very good. I haven't read it yet, but that's what actually drove the black bear market. And uh, that's what the Southern Americas were about. But primarily, Beaver. Next slide, please, Dan. So now we're going to get into post Lewis and Clark. So the United States has become a country. Uh, the War of Independence has been fought. The French, of Indi French and Indian War has been fought. Um, Mary Lewis and uh, what's the guy's name? William Clark agree to set out under a uh, presidential decree from Thomas Jefferson to explore this new purchase called Louisiana Purchase and get. Uh, get to the Pacific Ocean, ideally finding that same water route to the Pacific that turns out does not exist. Uh, but we didn't know that at the time. And we like to think of Lewis and Clark as these just wild pioneers doing crazy stuff. But in reality, they only beat what we think of as the mountain man fur trapper as seen in the little picture there by a month or two. Like there were mountain men in canoes following Lewis and Clark up the Missouri and branching off to trap beaver and go hunt um, other wild game and live off the land because you could make a dang good living. Uh, John Coulter uh, was on the Lewis and Clark expedition, ended up not coming all the way back because while he was on the way back, he met some more fur trappers coming up the Missouri and uh, decided to leave the Lewis and Clark expedition early to go show them all the places he had just seen bear or uh, beaver and go trap because that's just and that's I say all that to say just what a financial gain trapping was at the time. Um, another famous story that everybody knows, the Revenant, um, Hugh Glass, famous mountain man, famous fur trapper. Before he was a fur trapper, he was a wealthy Boston, or I'm sorry, Philadelphia, like a, what's it called, I like guess, ship, a commercial shipping captain, where he used to run to the Caribbeans, back to Philadelphia. Very, very wealthy, like upper 1% of Philadelphia society on the fast track. His kids were going to be taken care of. Everything was good. His ship actually gets captured by pirates in the Caribbean, Spanish pirates. He gets taken aboard, but he speaks Spanish, so they let him live. Ends up that pirate ship ends up crashing off the coast of Texas a year later, which is no not yet U.S. territory. Has to walk from approximately Corpus Christi, Texas, back to St. Louis, which takes him another year, and he gets captured by Indians, and it's a whole thing. But uh, when he gets to St. Louis, he learns that his wife, his children, have all died of uh, I, I don't know if it's the flu or the cold, some sort of disease. It's very curable now, uh, but his job is still there if he wants it. Instead, he sees the uh, the John J. Astor Fur Company sign, which says all 
aspiring young men willing to get rich, head west and go trap beaver for me, or essentially, I'm paraphrasing, and he decides to head west. So you have these new fur companies that are now competing with the Hudson's Bay Company for the first time. Uh, the John J. Astor Fur Company, which uh, he was this kind of wealthy guy, uh, you know him for like uh, Astoria, Oregon, founded that town. Um, oh man, what do you call it? A couple of hotel chains, just a, a really... Like I would consider him like uh, with like an Elon Musk of his day, just wildly wealthy, very good business guy. Anyway, then you have the Missouri Fur Company, which didn't last too terribly long, but still pretty good. And uh, anyway, these folks, they went out west, they trapped beavers. So now this is the one of the first times you see like you, Americans or people of European descent trapping beaver directly instead of trading with the Indians uh, or the Native Americans or whatever, whatever tribes were at the time. So, which caused a lot of uh, a lot of struggle, particularly with the Blackfeet Nation. There's a lot of stories about that, and I'll get into it. I don't want to eat into too much of our time because I know we started a little late. So I'm going to jump from, let's call that 1820s. I'm going to jump up to kind of modern day. So we have the invention of the Conibear trap, which I'll get into in a little further. That happens in 1950. Uh, but other than that, and uh, the invention of the Conibear trap and the coil spring trap, not much of it has changed, including like the equipment needed for trapping. Now we had a pretty big fur boom. Like obviously fur prices died off when silk came into uh, the hat making market. So you no longer have this strong desire for beaver felt hats. Now you have silk hats, which are coming from Southeast Asia, primarily China and India. So it no longer became profitably, profitable as profitable to be a mountain man right around the 1830s. But we had a fur boom, nowhere near as good as 1800s fur boom, but between like 1970, 1980, some say 1990, uh, which is when I started trapping where like if you worked union construction in the Missouri, like St. Louis, Missouri area, which is where I grew up, you're making $60 an hour as a union construction worker. It was still more beneficial to get laid off in October, go trap for the winter in Missouri, and then come back to work in like April and come back to building houses, being a carpenter, because you're still getting so much for your raccoons and beaver. And it was, it was nuts. It was like $40 a coon at some times, $15 for muskrat. It was insane. Now, today for prices, we did have a little bit of a boom uh, a few years ago where I was getting like $17 for a raccoon, but still primarily set by the European fashion markets, uh, primarily Eastern European. Although there was a trend in uh, Italy where the jeans all had this little fur lining on the pocket that made fur go up slightly. But primarily most of the fur trapped in the U.S. Uh, that sold in the commercial market gets sold to European or Asian markets. Um, and 90% of the total fur, it comes from fur farms, not wild trapped fur. Anyway, next slide, please, Dan. So uh, a couple sources for further reading. You guys are all going to get, like if you attend this, if you RSVP to these events, you're going to get a Microsoft Word document with all these links. So don't try and write them down. You're going to get this whole slideshow uh, as soon as I figure out how to send it out with uh because it's just a big file, so I may have to break it down into different pieces, but you are going to get it. Uh, so if you want to read this, uh, The Company by Derek uh, or Deckel Edge. Um, not a great storytelling book. It's a good factual book. It is a business review of the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, gives you a lot of good information. Very hard to read unless you're really into reading like business reports. Fur, Fortune, and Empire by Eric Doolin. Um, wonderful writer. Read everything he writes, but uh, that's much more of a storytelling thing then you have uh, mountain man john colter lewis clark expedition uh that's a good one it's, it's another storytelling book which is i prefer storytelling versus uh textbook but find your own there's a ton of good books out there next slide so now we're going to get into the north american model of wildlife conservation so in the united states and canada the North American model of wildlife conservation operates on seven interdependent principles, and these are the principles that manage wildlife conservation throughout the United States and Canada. So they manage fur bearers, they manage elk, deer, salmon, whatever we've got, we try and stick with these principles whenever we're going. So it's seven principles. Wildlife resources are conserved and held in trust for all citizens. That highlighted one is really hard to read, but it bans the commercial sale of wildlife is what that one does. Wildlife is allocated. According to democratic rule of law, wildlife might only be killed for legitimate non-frivolous purposes. Wildlife is an international resource. Every person has an equal opportunity under the law to participate in hunting and fishing, and scientific management is the proper means for wildlife conservation. So the biggest issue that I've highlighted there is number two, is the commercial sale of wildlife. So we just talked about 
the fur industry, right, or fur trapping for the purpose of selling. Now, that directly contradicts the way it was managed in the early 1800s, directly contradicts this North American model of wildlife conservation. So what has changed? How have we brought trapping into be within the guidelines of the North American model so we don't depopulate beaver to the point that we're dropping them out of airplanes across the West to repopulate? Next slide, Dan. So there's an article here. Again, you're going to get this link. It's a great article, but I pulled a couple key pieces out of it. Um, the key is regulation. So you could still sell furs at market. Note, if you look at various fur bearers, they are still managed by both the state and federal government to a point that we will not or are taking steps not to depopulate them to a point of species uh, instability, destability. There you go, destability. Um, so like, for example, I can trap, if I really got after it, probably 80 or 90 coons a year. If I really wanted to get after it and do it every day, and I'm not going to make a dent in the coon numbers as they stand. Like a bunch of people could do it. We did it in the 70s and the 80s. And it got wild. We still have way more coons than we really need on the landscape. But otters, bobcats, fishers in some states, um, gray fox in some states, wolves, obviously, wolverines. Depending on your local population, the state and federal fish and game agencies set a limit. So in Wisconsin, where I live, I can only trap two otters a year. And I have to get those otters tagged upon harvest. Now, it doesn't mean I won't catch a third or a fourth otter in beaver sets, but I'm taking steps to avoid those. And those third and fourth otters, I cannot sell. I have to turn over to the state fish and game agency. And you don't get in trouble because it happens with beaver trapping. Otters and beavers share a habitat. But the state fish and game agency is going to take that animal and use it for ideally education purposes, maybe get a taxidermy and put it in a, uh, like a children's learning center, take it around to schools, things like that. Um, but those otter species are very closely managed. Same with bobcat. Bobcat, I can't, can't draw a tag, but every four to five years, depending on Wisconsin. Fisher takes a little longer. That's like a 10-year draw, uh, depending on the part of the state you're trying to draw a fisher tag in. But that's, that's really the point there is regulation. You can't just go trap whatever you want, whenever you want. There's species management, there's season management, and there's population studies being done. So it really goes into uh, one of the other tenets, which is wildlife can only be killed for legitimate purposes. So one of those purposes, I know we all think of like uh, food as the primary purpose, like you can kill deer and you can eat it and you can kill pigs and you can eat it. And you can eat some of these animals are trapping. I do have some recipes in part two and part three based on some stuff we've tried. But primarily, uh, these are fur bearers. And what you're looking for is the fur. And you'll get to a point on your, your trapping self journey or your, your trapping adventures where you'll drive by and you'll see a coon or you'll see a mink that's been hit by a car crossing a bridge and just be like, ah, what a waste. Because it's just, if there's that many of them that they're getting hit by cars, like that fur could be in your house. It could be making hats, could be making koozies. I don't care what you do with it. You can make a comforter if you want to, but there's a lot of resources out there in fur. So just in case, you're just because you're not necessarily eating the meat doesn't mean it is not a valuable species to look after. Next slide. So uh, we're going to get into trapping ethics. Uh, the biggest thing, I have it down on the bottom in red, is just take the time to do it right. There's a hundred reasons to do trapping wrong. Uh, that picture, if you guys are new to trapping, you don't know, and you would have no reason to know, but uh, that's an illegal set, at least in Wisconsin, where that picture was taken, uh, which goes against trapping ethics. The first thing, obviously, always follow your state regulations when pursuing fur bearers, even exceed the regulations through uh, best management practices, which we'll get into in the next couple of slides. Um, dispatch an animal quickly, dispatch it humanely. Don't set a trap that may offend non-trappers. So what I mean by that, or by those last two, is you're going to catch your first coyote, your first fox in a foothold, and all you're going to want to do is pull out your phone and take pictures of it while it's sitting there struggling. I know it's tempting. Um, don't do it. Dispatch the animal. End the suffering as fast as you can. Be considerate. Um, then take your pictures. When you're taking those pictures, um, do your best to show as much dignity to the fur bear that you've just harvested or re reduced to your possession as you can. Um, I like to kind of wipe blood away from the face. I like try. I try to ear hole them when I'm dispatching. So try to wipe that blood away. Make sure the tongue's back in. If I want, I'm going to take them out of the trap. And uh, I just got some raccoons on my trap line the other day. Super thrilled. Like just big blanket raccoons beautiful and um i took a picture of them with the trap they're not in the trap but the trap is next to them because i like to explain 
the whole process of, yes, I've been walking the same four miles of this river every day for three weeks and first thing in the morning and I've fallen through the ice a couple of times because it's been a crazy winter and it's not, uh, it's not as easy as it seems. But even when you start trapping, you're going to walk around and you'll set your first step and you're going to take a step back and you're going to look at it and be like, man, this doesn't feel legal. And because it, it seems too easy almost, right? It seems like I'm going to put this bait down, I'm going to put this trap, and obviously I'm going to catch something first try. If you do, that's amazing. Good for you. But uh, in my experience, it takes a lot, it's a lot more work than people give, give uh, trappers credit for. Like you are out there every day. Once you start a trap line, you have to check it every day, at least in Wisconsin. I recommend wherever you are, despite the law, that you check it every day. Um, let's see, what's next? Oh, do not set a trap that may offend non-trappers. So where I trap, I get public access over this bridge because the waterway is public. So I can park near the bridge off the side of the road, walk down to the high water line, and I walk down this river and I walk back up this river every day. But I don't set a trap until the first bend in the river, especially if it's a land set. So basically something not under the water, under the ice in public view, because I don't want somebody driving across that river and seeing a fox or a coon in a foothold trap on the side of the bank. Like, it's super unlikely, but I check my sets between six and eight in the morning and I could leave and a fox in the middle of the day could come by and get stuck in that trap and everybody crossing from noon until 6 p.m. when it gets dark is going to see that fox and I'm not going to be there to check that trap until 6 a.m. So we're not going to set traps there. I'm going to set traps farther down river where I might not offend somebody. And generally, the farther away you get from people, the better the trapping is going to be. Now, that's not always true. I mean, there's some like livestock or uh, like poultry farm stuff or obviously being close to the farm is going to be your best bet. But that's more like nuisance trapping versus um, trapping as a pastime or trapping to gain fur, fur bears. Um, use the proper size trap and set for the targeted species. And I understand there's some things where, uh, like I just talked about with beaver, if you're setting on a beaver dam or in a beaver lodge or in good beaver habitat on a crossover set, you might grab an otter even if you're not looking for otter, you're looking for beaver. and Almost any, uh, we'll get into like, uh, I call them mailbox sets or cubby sets. Um, set them for raccoon, but every now and then you're going to catch a mink, catch a raccoon, you'll catch a, what's that, you catch a possum or a skunk. Still very happy with them, but do everything you can to avoid a non-targeted catch. Um, and then always think through your what-if scenarios. Uh, it's easy to set a trap, honestly. It's, uh, it's much harder to think about what could happen. So I have a couple coyote sets right now, foothold, dirt hole sets that we'll get into. but um, the biggest thing in Wisconsin is what happens if I catch a bear? What happens if I catch a wolf? What happens if I catch a bobcat, which is probably the most likely? How is what is my plan to get that foothold off that bobcat and release it safely back into the wild? Um, we can get in. We'll get into that, some of that. Love some guys really like a catch pole, but I'm normally by myself. So I have like a plywood shield with a notch in the bottom. Put the notch over the foot. Hold the shield up against my shoulder. Pull the. Uh, pull the trap open to where it. The jaws separate, just takes a little bit, and that cat's going to be going. Uh, I have not caught a wolf yet, and I have not caught a bear. Knock on wood, I really don't want to mess with those scenarios, especially because wolf is not legal in Wisconsin. Uh, cat is legal, but I haven't had a tag in two years. I haven't drawn one. Um, the biggest thing in red, take the time to do it right. Um, no matter where you're trapping, could be Alaska, could be Wisconsin, could be Florida. I don't know, but uh, where I'm trapping for the first uh, two weeks ago, is negative 10 degrees when I'm out there at six in the morning. I am freezing. I'm wearing waders. I'm wearing snowshoes. I'm exhausted. Um, a lot of reasons to hurry up and just get it done and then leave. Whether that's not pounding stakes in far enough, whether that's setting a trap a little haphazardly to where you're not going as far in as you want to, it doesn't pay off for anybody. Take the time to do it right, and you'll be much happier. Next slide. The uh, social media and trapping. Uh, you've got a link in there. It's a great link from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources uh, that really just talks through social media posts. And I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what I would do here and what I try to do with every social media. We're all on social media. We're all on Instagram. The kids are on TikTok and uh, with the new Twitter X. Um, but look, right now, I'll just tell you the facts. Trapping has the lowest public opinion re approval rating of all legal harvest methods. So people get on board with fishing real easy. They get on with hunting a little less than fishing, but still, when you say well-regulated hunting, they're on board. Trapping is pretty tough. We've had uh, some negative media ex media exposure, Bambi, uh, the fox and the hound, that uh, kind of turned a generation against us a little bit. Um, 
But the truth is trapping is an extremely valuable tool to manage fur bearer and habitat ecosystems. Um, and what I mean by that specifically for me is I'm a bird hunter. Like I do a lot of things in the woods. I love hunting deer. Um, I love fishing, but I love hunting grouse. I love hunting turkeys. I love hunting ducks. So every raccoon, every possum, every skunk, and even every mink to an extent uh, that I could take off this stretch of river that I'm hunting means more wood ducks in the, in the fall that have made it through the nesting period means less nesting predators, more turkeys in the spring, all kinds of stuff. So you see like there's two, if you've read the state of the bird report for 2023, um, pretty interesting, but it basically goes over various birds in the US. And I know right now you're like, Trevor, trapping class, stop talking about birds. Just give me a minute, I promise, come with, come with me here. The only group of birds in the US that's doing better in the past 10 years is waterfowl. Especially upland game birds are doing 30, there's 30% 30 less upland game birds than there in the past 10 years. It's a sharp decline. Now, primarily that is habitat based, but right behind habitat and lack of habitat, I guess, to be more specific, is fur bearer management. There's so many meso predators. What I mean by that is medium sized predators or nest rating predators. How do we get rid of them? If you look at the 1970s, 1980s, even early 90s, uh, the fur was so expensive that people could make a good living trapping it. We had much better wild game or wild uh, game bird numbers because less raccoons on the uh, landscape. But anyway, that's just a long story about how trapping fur bears is healthy to an ecosystem, even though some might not see it that way. But back to social media. Um, the biggest thing in social media, I know reels are big on Instagram or the little short videos. Don't just show caught an animal on your tailgate or hanging the fur in your garage. Tell the story a little bit. Um, first, yeah, practice legal and ethical trapping. Make sure you're highlighting that it's legal and ethical trapping in your post. Never show pictures of an animal in a trap. Take the animal out of the trap. Make sure you do as much to show that animal as much respect as you can. Uh, tongue in the mouth, wipe the excess, any excess blood off. Don't post pictures or uh, videos of yourself dispatching an animal in a trap. It is a necessary part of trapping. General public is not going to get get on board with that. It's not uh, not something to to elevate on social channels. Um, always show respect who harvested animals in photos. Just said that. Wipe off blood. Um, stay aware of your messaging around harvest animals. What I like to do is I like to tell the story of, well, I'm on this stretch of river because I've noticed this decline in wood ducks or there's this many traps and then I used to see this many birds and now I'm seeing this. Focus on your process of, hey, I didn't catch anything for my first two weeks, spent every day, two hours a day, walking through the cold, looking for sign, trying to make this work and just haven't. And I finally connected today. Tell a little bit of a story behind it. And it did, you don't have to do a video with yourself, but in the caption or whatever, just make sure you highlight the process, highlight the regulated trapping. That's the, the main message there. Next slide. Uh, so trapping BMPs, again, you'll get the link. Don't try and write it down. Um, so BMPs are best management practices. So in the 1990s, the American our Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, started doing some research. They worked with state agencies. They worked with various other federal entities to set what are called best management practices. So essentially, this is a list of what they consider, what this agency considers the best way of form of regulated trapping per species. So let's say, um, let's say Wisconsin decides to offer a pine marten tag. We've been doing rain reduction for the past uh, 15 years. Let's say population gets to a point where they want to do pine marten tags, similar to how they do bobcat and fisher tags. Well, I've never trapped pine marten. I don't know how. I can go on this website and I can get four or five different trapping practices that are going to be ethical, they're going to be legal, they're going to be the best way to trap according to this entity for pine marten. I can do the same if I move to Alaska and decide to start trapping wolves, or if I go to Maine and I want to start trapping black bears because that's still legal in Maine. Um, so basically, regulated trapping, necessary and effective wildlife management tool, and this national trapping best management practices are just ways to get it done. Now, I they will not always be in line with your state regulations. A lot of times they're going to be one step further in state regulations. Uh, give you an example of that. In Wisconsin, I cannot, uh, I could put, there's a body grip trap. Of a, I don't know if you guys can still see my screen while we're, while we're presenting, but I have a body grip trap in my hand. I can't set that without putting it in a box, right? And we'll get into the, the box set uh, in just a minute. But it has to be recessed so far in that box. Think of like a mailbox with a big mousetrap in it. Um, 
because if a dog comes through, especially if I'm trapping in November when bird season is still very much a thing, pointing dog or a duck dog comes through, they smell the bait, which is primarily fish oil that I use, but you can use whatever you want. Um, not whatever you want within legal regulations, but dog sticks its head in there. If it's not recessed back enough, I could trap a dog. Obviously, nobody wants to trap a dog. That's not something we want to do. So best manager practices is going to mandate that I move that trap back to such an extent that the dog cannot get its head far enough into that cage or that box trap to get caught. Next slide. So trapping gear needed. We're going to talk through uh, what I have, what, uh, what most people need. The biggest thing, I mean, is traps. I, I recommend we, uh, we are not sponsored by any trap company uh, for this event. So I could recommend whatever I want. And I recommend Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. There's a ton of traps out there from dudes who used to trap in the 80s and the 90s, and they're sitting in somebody's garage. Um, I'd say 50 to 60% of the traps I have, all I got all used. Um, we'll get into types of traps in a minute. You need a backpack. Uh, in the picture, there's a bucket. You could buy these like wicker sacks that are tr the traditional trapping pack. They're great. Um, I think they're more expensive than they're, they're good for. If you can see me, I have an old army rucksack with a cheap dollar store trash can stuck in it and uh, bungee corded in. Does the same thing. Whew, does not smell good because I've had some tuna in there for my raccoon sets. But uh, that's basically what you're going for is you want a big open satchel because you're just going to throw stuff in there. Uh, you want it semi-organized, but it's just going to get disorganized every day on the trap line, especially if you're having a good day. Uh, next one is going to be gauntlet gloves. So those are those big green gloves in the picture. I have a yellow pair, relatively inexpensive gloves that should go up to between your shoulder and your elbow, uh, especially if you're water trapping. Very essential to not uh, get cold, wet hands, cold, wet arms. They're great. Lure or bait. Um, go over the difference here. A lure would be like this coon catcher lure, which is just like an oil smell that you're producing that makes coons come in or this uh what is this one this is an otter lure it's like otter gland mix up that smells good but it's not necessarily what somebody wants to eat primarily what i use for bait is a mixture of cat food and tuna um it's cheap it's readily available you can mix it up you can put some vegetable glycerin in there and make like a paste and that would be bait because it's something that you're focused on eating versus just a, a smell attractant uh I'll give you another example like a thing of fox urine would be a lure a thing of all predator, which is a brand, would be bait. Let's see, what's the next one? Waders. You can get away with hip boots or sometimes even knee boots. Um, I just wear my fly fishing waders the whole time, socking foot waders. I put a real boot on um, because there's too many times, like today, when I was rushing, I wasn't taking the time, and I knew I had a 9.30 a.m. call that I had to get to, and I was trying to rush on my way back from the trap line, decided to cut across some ice that I shouldn't have, and I went in over my waist still. I was wearing the waders, so I was okay, but I would recommend you just go with the waders instead of trying to do the hip boots. Also, the hip boots are almost just as expensive as the waders now. So next, a uh, pair of pliers. Any old pliers from your dad's garage or your garage will do. I, I take the rattiest set that I have because they're just going to get worse. They're going to get rusty. They're going to get wet and uh, oil them up. They'll do just fine. Oh, if those pliers double as wire snips, that's a good thing. You'll always end up needing some wire. You can get it at the hardware store, you can get it at the trapping supply stores, but whether you're wiring that trap to like a tree branch for a fisher set, or you need to wire like a new trap tag onto your traps, because one fell off, always comes in handy. So if your pliers are not also snips, you need a pair of snips. Uh, a multi-tool or a Gerber, whatever you guys call them in your neck of the woods, Leatherman, uh, can do most of that stuff for you. Uh, trap tags, like I said. Uh, so again, trust your state's regulations, read your state's regulations. But in Wisconsin, I have to have a trap tag that is engraved. I don't know if you guys can see that. So it's got my name on it and it has my DNR number. Um, some folks have you put your address and your phone number on there. I just have DNR number because um, the DNR num the DNR guy is going to be able to run my stuff in his truck and get my number from there, and uh, it only allows you three lines, and I do a little bit of trapping across the border in Illinois. So I have my name, my Wisconsin DNR number, and my Illinois DNR number. That's what on my trap tags, but again, read your local regs. Sometimes they will mandate that you have your phone number on there. Um, trap safety, if you're doing a lot of beaver trapping or underwater trapping, 
or any basically trapping with a cone bear or something that will hurt you if it goes off accidentally. Get yourself trap safety. You can make them. Essentially, it's a clip that will prevent the trap from going off even if you accidentally fire it until you take that trap safety off. Um, I use it whenever I remember to use it. I should use it more. Uh, let's see. Next is dry clothes. I have fallen through in 10 degree weather through ice that's just not safe um, more times than I can. Uh, probably not more. At least Between 10 and 20 times, I'll, I'll, I'll estimate. Um, keep moving. Get back to the truck. It's cold. You don't want to stand still. But I, I keep a dry pair of pants, just sweatpants, dry boots, dry hoodie in the truck. Make it to make it 10 times better uh, to the point that I would label that essential equipment. Um, what I don't have on there is an axe. Um, you use it as a hammer. You end up chopping willows for beaver traps. But uh, you get they have fancy beaver or uh, sorry, fancy trapping hammers. Again, feel free to buy those if that's if you're so inclined. They're like part shovel, part pick, part hammer, like a little mini Pulaski. Um, I just have a regular hatchet, medium sized. Next slide. All right, great. So trap type basics. So I'm going to split traps into two groups here. First are kill traps. These are traps that are designed to dispatch the animal when it is trapped. Like by being trapped, that animal will get dispatched. Uh, the first one of those that I have there is a colony trap. So if you look in the bottom, now that's more of a cage trap, but I'm holding one up. This is a colony trap. It's essentially a cage trap, or it is a type of cage trap, but I would submerge this in the water in a run, primarily for mink and muskrat. They're going to be able to swim in. The doors drop just by gravity. They can't swim out. They will drown in this, in this uh, colony trap, primarily for muskrat. Every now and then you will catch a mink in there. But uh, this one from Shields, pretty, pretty new, but it like folds flat, so I can stick it in the pack pretty easy and then unfold it when I get there. Uh, next one is going to be a beaver snare. Um, looks like this, made of cable. So this is, pr I primarily do this under the ice this time of year, but since it's been a crazy winter, we don't have ice. Um, but that's a snare that's done underwater. You can't do a snare on dry land in Wisconsin. But uh, anyway, snare into water, animal gets caught in the snare, beaver gets caught in the snare, drowns, perishes. Conibear trap, just had one. This is a... 220 bear, uh, also called a body grip set or a body grip trap. Basically, if this is a big mouse trap, animal is going to swim through this or crawl through this. If it's in a, a cubby or a mailbox set, trap will go off. Ideally, in a perfect scenario, it hits the animal behind the head, separating the skull from the spinal column if you've done it right, and that animal is dispatched almost immediately. If you're a little off or the animal is a little big or... Uh, Let's say you catch a raccoon or even a fox in your mink set, it's happened, uh, the animal will end up suffocating because this trap will collapse its lungs and it's not as immediate, but it is fatal. Um, next would be a foothold with a submersion system. So similar system to a snare where that loop will only close, it will not loosen. We're gonna put a foothold trap like this, foothold trap here, uh, but I'm gonna run that cable, one end on dry land, one end in deep water. So as the animal tries to swim away, it can only go deeper, it can't go shallower, gets stuck in the deep water, perishes. Now, the live traps. The cage trap is uh, very similar to the colony trap I just showed you, except we put this one on dry land, and it has a little uh, a trigger mechanism, whereas when the animal steps on that trigger, the uh, gate closes behind them, and you can retain that animal alive for you to... Uh, Harvest and reduce to your possession or relocate to another area. Um, next one is a foothold trap. Been messing with those all day because I just broke one today. But uh, foothold traps come in a couple times, a couple different kinds that we're going to get into later in the series. But traps animal by the foot. Um, that's it. Next is a cable restraint. So people see cable restraint and they think snare, or they see snare and they think cable restraint. And they get them confused all the time. The difference between a snare and a cable restraint is a snare will only close. It will not loosen up. It will strangle an animal. A cable restraint has a stop on it to where it will only get so small. It will not strangle an animal. Cable restraints also have breakaway devices and swivels. So when you catch a coyote on a cable restraint, you basically have that like cheap leash that you get at the vet, except it's made out of cable. The one that you just run through the loop and it tightens. 
but it won't tighten to the point that it'll choke that coyote. So you have that coyote alive and well if you choose to release it. So like in Wisconsin, when I have a, I wouldn't say super high chance, but a, a high enough chance to catch a bobcat in my coyote sets, if I were to use a snare, it would kill that bobcat and also be illegal. But let's say snares were legal, I would still want to use a cable restraint so that I can release that cat unharmed and it can run off. Next slide. Um, so now we're going to get into crap sizes. This is not going to make sense to you. It doesn't make sense to anybody. We kind of built, like we being the trapping community, kind of built this size platform while we were flying the plane and never looked, looked, looked at it twice. So we'll start at the top. Um, we have a 110. That's your, your big, well, I shouldn't say your big. It's your smallest trap, but it's a common muskrat and mink trap. 110 Magnum. Magnum just means it's a stronger spring. Uh, all the 110s I see now are Magnums. I don't see hardly any regular 110s anymore. Um, but anyway, four and a half by four and a half. Great for muskrat, great for mink. Uh, every now and then you will catch a coon or a possum in one, and it will dispatch it, but ideal for mink and muskrat. The 120, same exact size, except it's got two springs. And, th and that's that. That's uh, now that I've actually, I've caught more, uh, more raccoons in than mink um and it does a just fine job especially if you put it in the, the cubby set and does wonderful uh the 150 magnum some people use these underwater for uh for mink they'll do they'll do fine on muskrats but 150 is a five inch tag the 155 nope it's not a five and a half it's still the five inch tag or a five inch size uh trap it's just got two springs on it the 159 now i hadn't seen this until i saw this uh this picture that you can see from the watermark that I, I took from the internet. Uh, the 159 only exists because there's some states and some regulations that dictate the size of these conibears that a 160 is too big, so they make a 159 that will still be legal in those states. Um, 160, it's the next size up. Uh, I do not have one because mine are all set right now. So they're all, that's my go-to trap for coon, uh, for mink, when I use these uh, box sets or cubby sets that I'll get into. Uh, they're also, they will work on otter if you get the right size run. The 160 in Wisconsin, again, follow your own state's regulations. But in the 160, I can set on dry land without, even with the size rest restrictions, and still be legal in Wisconsin. So if I have a super shallow creek between, like if I'm pursuing otter, and there's a super shallow creek between water sources, I can put that 160 in there and not worry about the legality of having to be underwater like I would with a 220 or a 330, because it's a legal dry land set, and I'll catch otter in that set, and it dispatches them very well. Uh, the next up is the 220. The uh, the 220 is marketed primarily for otter. Uh, I know in the northern states they do a lot of like like Wisconsin, uh, they do a lot of fisher with 220s. They'll do um, you can get you can catch a beaver in 220. Uh, in my otter set with my 220 that I still have out on the river today, because I'm hoping to grab an otter. Uh, I caught a muskrat in the other day. It's under, uh, under the ice set. Whatever swims through it is going to get caught. Uh, the 280, I've never used the 280. It's between a 220 and a 330. Um, I've never seen a use for it. I always have 220s and 330s on hand. But uh, 280, happy medium. If your state regulates size to where you can use a 280 but not a 330, I'm guessing that's what that uh, goes to. The 330 Magnum is the biggest one. I should say that is what I catch, like, at least 60% of my beavers in. It's huge. It uh, it will go off and it will really hurt if you are inside it when it goes off. Um, depending on your bone structure, your weight, um, the part of you that gets caught in it, it could break break toes, break wrists, break ankles. It's a, it's a powerful trap. Ideally, that is for beaver. And I don't know anybody who uses it except for beaver, maybe in Alaska or uh, somewhere where they're trapping wolverine or some other large animal on land where it's legal they'd use them, but I primarily use those, I only use those under the water or under the ice for beaver. Next slide. So uh, we're going through foothold traps now. These are sizing, this is the long spring trap. Now I don't have one on hand. I meant to grab it, uh, it's in my weasel box, which we'll get into in a minute, but uh, the only long spring trap I have is a number zero long spring, not pictured, but it's very, very small. Um, and you'll see the long spring refers to those long sticks that appear to come out of the traps there. Those are the springs. Think of it like a uh, like a leaf spring more than a uh, coil spring. 
which we'll get into next. But number one long string spring has one uh, spring. What's called number the number one? The number one also refers to the size. Uh, now the number one long spring sure grip. Uh, you'll see it kind of has a little lever there. I should have picked one up at the store for this class. But what that lever does is it pushes the rest of the animal away from its own leg so it can't chew it off. So it's a very, uh, it's a great set for mink. Mink are kind of notorious for, for chewing and getting their way out of a trap. So what it does is it'll just pin the arm in the trap and the rest of the animal away from getting to its own hand so that it doesn't further injure itself and you can dispatch it as needed. The number 11 long spring, same size as the number one, just has two springs. Um, now, depending on where you're at in the country and what uh, trapping supply platform you're going to, you may find more sizes than this, but these are the most common is the number four long spring and the number five long spring. In my experience, the number five primarily for beaver used as a, uh, an under, a water set or a drowner set or a submersion set uh, with a caster, uh, a caster oil mound or caster mound. Uh, number four, some guys swear to use these on bobcats in the winter when they're set with ice, like a coil spring would develop ice and then the springs wouldn't go off. This won't ice up. But again, you can use that number four under the water as well. Um, really, what you're getting into the difference here is just the distance between the jaws and states do have regulations on those distances and how you can use them in various scenarios. So again, please pay attention to your state fishing game website. Next. Uh, so these are the coil springs. A lot of coil springs out there. Um, they kind of get wild. So number one coil spring uh, is ideal for mink and muskrat. You catch a coon in it and it'll probably be okay. Possum will be fine. Skunk will be fine. Uh, coons do have more pullout power than skunks and possums. So I would not recommend, uh, recommend it. I, I use primarily 1.5 coil springs. I have a couple number twos, but uh, the 1.5 is great. That'll hold a coon perfectly fine um you're not going to get too much pull out there so the next one if we're going from on the top row there from left to right as you read then you have the 1.5 csos so cs is coil spring the os is offset so what that means is the jaws are offset to the point that they will not you see in my little screen these jaws close all the way to each other there's no space there the offset jaws will not close all the way. They will leave a gap strategically. And the point of that is they are more expensive than the uh, their standard coil spring or your standard jaw type. But what they'll do is with that gap, your animal will still get caught, but it will not ever lose circulation in its paw. So when the animal loses circulation, it's much more likely to chew its foot off, which we've all, you know, you heard about or you've seen in, in movies or TV shows. It won't chew its foot, foot off, though, if it doesn't lose circulation. So like the... Um, the stop loss with that lever that we showed on the long spring, very similar uh, for those offset jaws. Then you go up, you have the 1.65. I don't have any of those. I have a couple 1.75s here, which are slightly bigger than the 1.5s. And I have a one number two. The one I was just showing you is Victor number two from 1970. Um, then we get down, the number threes are a little bigger. Uh, the number two is good. I mean, people swear by number threes for coyotes, but I catch more uh, coyotes and foxes in the 1.75s or the one and three quarters than I do anything else. Um, then at the bottom, you get into dogless traps. So what that means, we'll get into the, the parts of the trap, but the little lever that keeps the pan, like that gets tripped to set the trap off, is called the dog here. So a dogless, instead of having a lever that uh, can go off, it has a mechanism inside to where it will automatically kind of latch there. Uh, much easier to set, much safer. Again, a little bit more expensive. Uh, not necessarily safer for the animal. Does the same thing to the animal. It's uh, safer for you. Uh, next slide, please. So now let's get into my trapping bag. And I know we're running over on time. I'm sorry. It's my fault that we started late. Um, so I carry the backpack that you guys saw earlier. It's an old army rucksack with a trash can stuffed in it, one of those plastic jobs from the dollar store. So I carry, in addition to the stuff I went early, said earlier, I have a couple extra stakes in here, but uh, I carry a trap setter. I've painted mine orange because I tend to lose shit in the snow and the, the ground if it's not orange. So it's basically just a big scissors with some notches cut out at the top, and that helps me set 330s and 220s. You'll get to a point where your finger strength is such that you don't necessarily need this, um, but it, it does make it easier, just to, to set, especially in uh, 
if you set one on your foot or something, a 330, you get caught, you're gonna want this because it's easier. Next, axe. We talked about the axe. Uh, not a sponsor, but I recommend Snow and Neely Company. Like snow is in stuff that falls in the winter, and Neely like the name. Made in the USA, it is a trapper axe. I don't know if it's better or worse than any other axe, but I try to go with US made companies. Um, and if anybody just happens to work there and they're willing to sponsor, I would love a sponsorship from them for BHA. Um, next, gloves. So wherever I'm trapping, I have multiple pairs of gloves. So just these little like cheap gloves. I, I don't wanna say that it will make all the difference, especially when you're canine trapping to hide that scent when you're setting traps and everything. But I do think it makes some difference. I have guys say all the time, I never wore gloves and I catch plenty of coyotes. So that's great. I catch more when I wear gloves, it seems. And it could be a superstition, but gloves. Uh, now traps. Now my traps that I carry around normally run seasonally. I'm normally coon and canine trapping or water trapping for beaver, otter, mink, and muskrat. Um, so like when the river's iced over like this, I'll set a beaver set, maybe one. But mostly I'm trapping coons and I'm trapping coyotes and I'm trapping foxes. So I'll have primarily footholds and um, cable restraints. Now, though, I've got open water. So I'm trying to trap pretty much anything. So my trap's super heavy. So I have a mix of counter bears, a mix of footholds, a mix of under ice snares and all kinds of stuff. Um, but normally you know, there's no need to carry extra stuff. And you'll do it for a season. You're like, oh, I never know when I'm going to find a good place to put this beaver set. And just leave that big old 330 at the truck. You can come back for it if it's really that good. Um, save your back a little bit. Uh, I also run the FHF gear chest pack. Now, to be fair, they are a sponsor, but uh, they were our first sponsor for the AFI, and uh, they're super loyal. Veteran, uh, police officer and veteran owned, they do a great job. Um, but that chest pack, I keep my scents and my lures in there because that way it's on my person and I don't forget it in the truck. And then my scents and my lures don't freeze up because they're in the garage or in the house at night. Uh, I keep my gauntlets, which we'll remember those big yellow gloves, just so they're readily accessible. Stuff them in there. What else do we have here? Uh, 550 cord. I have 50, 550 cord all over at all times, no matter what I'm hunting or fishing. It just comes in handy. Um, example of the day, yeah, two days ago when I caught those coons, um, I was doing a really quick, quick run up the line. It was shitty weather and raining the night before, so I didn't think I'd get anything. Uh, get to the very end of my line, which is, you know, almost four miles from the truck. And I have two coons right next to each other in, uh, in, in a pocket. And one's in a pocket set and one's in a uh, blind set. So 550 cord was able to get them dispatched uh, with, with, my, with my 22 rifle um, and then tie them with 550 cord to like a strap that I was able to tow them out of there without the ice where they just slid on the ice because I didn't bring my pack because I was in a rush. And again, like I said at the beginning, don't rush. It'll be easier on yourself. And I break my own rule all the time. Um, also, I have the trap safety. Showed you guys earlier, but that trap safety gets clipped on to my chest pack. So it's right in front of me at all times and I'm more likely to use it um wire spool same thing i have a spool of copper wire where did that thing go i unclipped it to show you guys and now it's gone look what you did no but it's just a spool of little wire um again comes in handy wire your trap tags on do whatever i normally keep a couple of trap tags in there a couple extra snaps or some swivels or things i would need to uh to put on and uh also a hand warmer that was honestly, it was in there left over from deer season, but uh, I stand by it. I like the hand warmer. Here it is. I just keep a carabiner, spool of wire, trap safety, clips on in my chest pack. Next slide. Um, so there's some trapping accessories. If you've gone online and you've looked at like trapping stuff, there's a ton of stuff. I'm gonna try and simplify it for you. So the first thing are steaks. Now you've seen there's a bunch of different kinds of steaks. This is a tea steak because it makes a tea. And these are primarily used for water trapping because you're not intending to drive this steak all the way in the ground. You're still always going to have a handle to pull from. These the ones I have painted the tops. Uh, I was going for orange, but they look pretty red at this point. Not sure how that happened. Now you also have rebar steaks or uh, like a washer steak, I think is what they call this. So this you would go all the way into the ground and you would embed it under the trap. So you have Trap, chain, stake. I don't know if you can see that, but stake. Um, get the best stakes you can afford. 
nobody wants to walk up to where your set should be and not have a critter or a trap there uh because it's pulled your stake out and, and they will surprise you i have had raccoons pull out a 24 inch stake before and i was able to recover them because it kind of acts like a drag but um you don't want that if you want if you're concerned at all double stake it oh uh, what's the next thing drag so the drag uh you see it's the leftmost picture on your screen it's basically like a grappling hook some some places call it a, dra a grapple but it's a drag so some folks swear by this because what will happen is the drag the animal will get trapped in a foothold it'll start to run off and that drag will catch on bushes it'll catch on trees and you won't have a hard stopping point it's like the trap this foothold anchored down by the chain and the stake you have a hard pullout point but on a drag it's going to be against a tree that'll kind of flex and they won't animal won't get that hard that hard point to be able to pull its foot out very common with uh larger canines like wolves and uh in far north wisconsin people use them for coyotes and even bobcats uh next we have cable 332nd aircraft cable is the go-to uh, i think that's legal in all 50 states but again check your local regs uh comes in big spools relatively inexpensive you can make a bunch of stuff with it you can make your own snares you can make your own cable restraints and uh it also makes a good uh extension i put some on some of my 330s that i know are going to be deep under the ice and i want like a 10 foot or uh or sometimes even like a 12 foot uh anchor system where i'm trying to anchor it far enough on shore where i'm going in the solid dirt and not uh like sandy bottom of a river uh stops so if you look at the far right picture up there um we have, we have a minimum loop stop ferrule so that's what i was talking about with the cable restraint earlier um so that stop ferrule will stop that cable restraint from shrinking to the point where it will strangle the animal and make it uh in combination with the relaxing lock which you'll see at the top of that same picture will make sure that that uh, cable restraint can loosen when the animal is not struggling uh breakaway device so a breakaway device you'll have to have them on cable restraints in wisconsin some folks or some states will have you have them even on your um your footholds it depends on the state you're in please look at your local regulations but a breakaway device basically is a uh a predetermined uh a part of the a part of your trap that will break under a predetermined weight so if you catch a bear or a deer like common in the cable restraint if for whatever reason you accidentally catch a deer it's not gonna suffocate because you've got the stop barrel but you don't want a deer hanging out there so you have a uh, a breakaway device that that deer will be able to pull hard enough to trigger the breakaway device whereas a coyote won't be able to the deer will run off and probably get that uh, cable restraint off in a couple hours if not a couple days because it doesn't lock down it can slide off a uh, relaxing lock just talked about that that helps the uh the cable restraint relax and not lock down on a tightened uh on a uh, and tighten around something's neck like a snare would and you have one-way slides you don't have a picture of a one-way slide i have one right here so you can see that this is just an l bracket so if you put it up here on a snare slides this way really well but if i try to slide it back it kinks up makes makes it a one-way slide where if i wanted to articulate my hand such and keep it really close i can slide it but an animal panicking especially one that's been trapped is going to pull away and it will not be able to slide back up that's what you make your submersion sets out of with your uh with your cables that take that foothold into deep water like we talked about earlier next slide um identifying areas to trap shameless plug for onyx it's a great bha sponsor um you're all going to get a free onyx membership for attending tonight really appreciate uh, your patience um it's going to go to whatever email you have in your bha account so that's the email that's tied to your BHA member profile that you use to RSVP. Get it on X. It's going to be great. Um, get on there, scout, look at some e-scouting. I'll show you some screenshots in a second. But the biggest thing, if you just want to go out and catch something, walk the creeks, especially this time of year. You're going to find footprints, and that'll show you where the critters are. Next slide. So this is beaver habitat location. If you look at uh, the X's there, that's where I've dropped pins where I set beaver traps traditionally. But if you look really close, um, I said better, if you look in like the lower left, you see that green part of algae going out to the lake and you see it looks like a line dissecting it. So that's a line that's been kept open. A water line that's been kept open. You have the same things closer to shore that if you look really closely, you can see 
And what that is, that's beavers traveling to shore to grab trees and coming back out. Like it may not be, may not necessarily be beavers, could be muskrats, but if it's visible on onyx, it's probably a larger critter like a beaver. And, and I'll take a muskrat, to be honest with you. I think they're great. They're just tiny beavers, bite-sized beavers. Next slide. So this next, uh, for coon habitat, I'm looking at uh, den trees or what could be den trees. So primarily in this picture, what I'm looking at is that downed tree coming across the river. So you see, I have an area of timber. I have a waterway. It's got fish in it. It's got crawfish. I've got a downed tree specifically that I would want to check out because there's probably stuff running around in there, bugs, grubs, things that they're eating. But important, more also important, across that river you see is an ag field. Uh, it looks like it's cut corn. Ideal. You got food. You have cover. You have water. I'm going to catch coon there. Next slide. I don't have a fancy picture for coyotes. I'm sorry, but this time of year, uh, most of the coyote sets that I have out, I've either seen a coyote there, I've seen coyote tracks, or somebody I know has seen a coyote there and said, hey, you should come set a set here. There's Coyotes are dramatically popular all over the U.S. They're highly popular. Oh, now I don't say overpopulated, but they are, they are everywhere. You could find them in downtown Chicago. I guarantee you, you could find a coyote pretty close to your house. Just get out there, walk the rivers, walk the snow, walk the fields, and look for footprints. Next. Uh, so paw prints, again, you'll get a copy of this slide, so no need to memorize it. You can also Google it, but uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of what you're looking for. The biggest giveaways um, that I see is, like the way I distinguish stuff, is either a four-toed animal or a five-toed animal. And yes, I know even the four-toed animals have a fifth toe, but in the track, like the red fox, the gray fox, the bobcat, you're showing four toes. The rest of them are showing a five toads. So that splits up the weevil, the weasels, the badgers, the fishers, the minks, the raccoons. So then you're just looking at size. I mean, there's other distinguishing factors, but uh, really like the difference between a pine martin and a fisher track is just size. They're going to look very, very similar because they're in the same family of critters. Um, the skunk and the raccoon, you're looking at the back foot, which is elongated. And as long as it doesn't have a goofy thumb that sticks out like the possum, then you're only just looking at size difference between the raccoon and the skunk. Um, weasel, super small. Anybody can catch weasel, but that's kind of what I break that down into. Next slide. Um, where to start? So if you wanted to look at the two trapping techniques that are the most popular for beginner trappers, start with muskrats and start with weasel boxes. Now you could download plans off the internet for a weasel box, but I have a picture there on the right side of your screen. So it's a shoebox size box. Essentially, you can build it out of one by. You can buy them already built, but it's more fun to build them together, especially if you have kids. Uh, drill a two-inch hole in the front and put a rat trap in there. And a little bit of, uh, if you can get like my mice, like dead mice from like a pet store, that would be great. Like people use to feed their snakes and stuff. But uh, you can also get like a little electric squeaker. I don't know where to get it or what it is. I don't think it's intended for a weasel trap. But again, check your local regs. See if you're allowed to use an electronic little squeaker that goes in there. But super simple. In Wisconsin, you can trap, trap for weasels all year round. They're beautiful in the winter. They're pure white. If you get one in like November, October area, they can be between brown and a white, which is it's just a cool little hide to, uh, to mess around with. Now, what I started trapping with, I still think is the best, but I'm, I'm also particular. Muskrats. Uh, a couple of these 110 conibears, bears. So that's small, four and a half inch conibear. bear. Um, some stakes. You can, you can get specialized stands. I have one here. Hold on. So if you can see this, it's a long stand and it has a specialized little uh, little notch there for your 110 to sit in. And you can shove this all the way into the ground so it sits on the ground. And put, uh, you see in the lower left picture there, you've got a carrot on there. So it's going to go underneath the water. They're going to see the carrot. They're going to swim up to it, grab the carrot, trap will go off. You get yourself a muskrat. Now you could do the same thing with a foothold if you have a number one or a number one and a half inch foothold. And that's the middle picture where you have, um, uh, I believe uh, that's white painted 3 8 rebar. Could be a plastic rod of some sort. I use 3 8 rebar. Um, stick that carrot on a little hook and put the, uh, the number one and a half on a bracket right below the water line. So that bracket holds it temporarily. Muskrat climbs up down there to get the carrot. Trap goes off, falls off the, st falls off the, uh, the stand, and you have it. The other easy, easy way, we talked about it first off, Colony trap, it's like 16 bucks at Shields or Cabela's or wherever. Folds, easy to carry. Go find a little creek and you'll catch a muskrat with it. Um, muskrat habitat, people ask me about that uh, before the class. If there's beaver there, there's muskrat there, man. They're uh, they're all over the place. They have a little bit, picture of Beaver Lodge. 
or a beaver hut, but with made out of cattails, that's a muskrat hut. Um, they're great. I love them. Uh, very soft fur. But those are the two things that if I just wanted to get into trapping with a minimal amount of investment monetarily wise, minimum amount of time, that's what I would get into. And uh, with the with the muskrats, you may even get lucky and catch a mink in that trap. And that's even cooler. I don't know why I think mink are cooler than muskrats. Ideally, they're, they're like the same, but I don't know to me, mink are cooler. Next slide. Um, so that's the end of part one. Um, again, next uh, next week, we're going to get into land trapping, or we're going to talk about fox, coyote, um, badger, things to trap on land. The week after that will be water trapping. Now, parts of those are going to be a little repetitive as far as type of trap, as far as type of set, but that's what we're getting into next week. Again, sorry for the technical delays at the beginning of this call, but uh, I'm, I'm here for questions as long as you guys want me here. You folks want me here. So uh, if you can top of your screen, there's like a raise your hand button. You can hit that or just shout stuff out. Um, again, that's kind of how this class works or how these class works. I try to keep them more conversational um, when we do them in person. But uh, really, the big you could Google all the stuff I just showed you. The biggest thing is just having access to somebody who's done it and who's made all the mistakes who can tell you what not to do. Uh, let's talk about other last piece of advice. I just talked about it, but uh, you're going to get your hand stuck in a trap. It's going to happen. You, I recommend it. Nobody does it. I didn't do it. But uh, when it was recommended to me when I was 10 years old, but going to get your hand stuck in a trap eventually. It's better to do it when you are at, um, at your house in a controlled environment. So when it happens in the field, you know how to get it off. And uh, it's going to hurt. It's not going to hurt that bad, though. This is normally the part where I put my hand in here, but I don't really want to. So I'm not going to do it. No, I got to do it. I'll put something in there. We'll put this axe handle in there. Hits the trigger. Trap goes off. Here. I've done it. That's just the 110. I've done it with the 160. It was freezing cold out. It really hurt. Doesn't break your fingers. Doesn't do anything like that. You pull it off and you'll be fine. Um, if there's no questions, I'll uh, stop the recording. Stop recording.